Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to reInvent. Have you ever wondered if I can improve the way I do monitoring and observability so my day-to-day -day life becomes more easier? You may have many tools, but you don't know how to effectively use them. Imagine this, a guidebook or a roadmap, which effectively shows you how you can monitor and observe the performance of your applications and infrastructure. Hello, my name is Toshal, and with me I have Helen and Anya, and we are from AWS Observability team. We help our customers with the AWS Observability journey. Today we're going to show you how you can effectively build an observability strategy in eight steps. So let's get started. In order for you to go on a journey, first you need to figure out where to start. Once we know where to start, we will then actually show you why building an observability strategy is important. From there, we're going to show you what you should be observing, what you should be monitoring. And then we'll finally show you how you should be observing as well. And of course, we're going to have some cool demos to go along on the journey as well. So let's get started. We'll start with where. We have heard from our customers that they are looking for a prescriptive guidance to monitor their applications, but they don't know where to start. They want to build observability practices and culture in their organizations. And they're looking for help. So we have developed AWS Observability Maturity Model. As your usage with AWS grows, the observability is supposed to grow linearly with that, but in reality, it doesn't. So this essential framework help you and organizations to find out where you are so you know where to go to improve the maturity of your organizations in terms of observability. So let's look at these stages in details. We start with the foundational monitoring. This is the most foundational state of an organization, which are essentially collecting telemetry data. You have various teams. They're collecting logs or metrics. But these are all siloed teams. There is no common practice in place. So at this stage, you should be start setting some realistic goals for improvement, because if it's siloed, you don't have a way to debug throughout your organization's applications or end-to-end -end observability. This is where I think stage two comes in. This is the intermediate monitoring. This is all about collecting now your telemetry signals, but also doing the analysis and insights. You have now well-defined processes in place. However, you don't have the practice and policies defined org-wide, so you're still spending a lot of time debugging the issues. At this stage, you should be defining the actionable KPIs. This KPI should help you deliver what you promised to your customers. Once you define the KPI, this is where the most mature stage of observability comes in, what we have seen with our customers. This is the stage where we have seen customers have an org-wide strategy in place. They have a centralized team, like an SRE team or DevOps team, platform team. I'm sure many of you are part of those teams as well. This team is essentially responsible for defining the strategy and policies for the organization, and they put it in place. And this essentially allows organizations to deliver the service level objectives, which is what matters to your customers. Observe what matters. Now at this stage, you should be start looking into integrating with other critical systems, like security, or incident management, or reliability. You should also be try looking into now AI ML tools, or data modeling on that, to automate a lot of the processes and operations. And this is where what we call the stage four, or proactive observability comes in. You have generated wealth of data. 
But now you are using this AI ML tools to continuously improving on your processes, or your long-term trend analysis. You are identifying patterns, trend in the system performance. And this should allow you to improve the operation processes and optimize resource allocations. But it doesn't end here. You should always continue to improve and reiterate to essentially deliver better experience for your customers. Remember, observability is a journey, not a destination. And you'll always look for ways to improve the day-to-day -day operations. With that, I'm going to hand over to Anya and Helen for the rest of the journey. Thank you. OK, so now that you know where you are and you've identified where you want to be, let's talk about why an effective observability strategy is really important. And let's start uh, with a pretty representative day for many users. Tell me if this resonates with you. It certainly resonates with my days as an SRE. So you come into the office, and you've got this blissful ignorance. If you work for a startup, you get in a hammock. Uh, but basically, this week, we're going to get our project rag done, right? Incident was last week. This week, we're going to get the backlog done. Uh, but then an alarm comes in. And you're confused, like, the incident was last week, stuff was broken last week, what's wrong now? Then time starts passing by, and unfortunately, very often, that leads to stress. Now, for me, that stress was typically my manager standing, like, always there, behind me, and going, Anya, what's the ETA for the fix? What's wrong? What's the impact? Can you jump on the incident bridge? And I'm, you know, at the time I had an auto scaling group of eight instances, so I had eight tabs open, you know, tailing a log file on those eight tabs, looking somewhere else at the traces, looking at some graphs. I've no idea what the root cause is and what the ETA is, let alone have time to jump on an incident bridge. So then comes the false hope. It was a rogue IM role last week, right? Maybe it's that. So then you implement fixes that don't work. And then comes the desperation. Um, I don't know if anybody else has done that, but has anybody ever just rebooted a database server because it might fix the problem? <laughs> that, you know, that great database server that's done nothing to you for two years, but let's just go reboot and stuff. Was it just me? I've got no hands up. Anybody <laughs> just randomly reboot stuff? That's better. OK, yep. OK, but then eventually somebody works out that root cause. You feel this sense of enlightenment. Uh, next step is actually quite, quite quick. You know how to apply a fix. You know how to QA a fix. And then you're back to your blissful ignorance and back in that hammock if you've got one in the office. Now, the thing is, there will always be problems. But the aim of a good observability strategy is to keep that circle as quick as possible it's to select the tools that will help you correlate so that hopefully you can also cut out stress, false hope, and desperation out of your day. So this is why it's important to build a strong observability strategy. Oh, my goodness. I have been in that situation so many times. And while it's awesome to reduce that cycle and that stress that goes along with it, I want to keep her happy. Um, Observability is about a lot more than just resolving incidents or even predicting them. Observability is also about understanding the impact. Anya, if you had known how many people that that incident was affecting, maybe you could have made better decisions about who to bring in and when, what kind of fix to do. Do we need to panic now? Can we slot it in work next week? Understanding the impact lets us make good decisions about what to do and when. But more broadly, it's about data-driven decisions. So for example, on the technical side, you did a deployment. Has it made anything worse? Has it delivered the benefits you hoped it would? On the business side, did your marketing campaign work? Has your user experience improved? When we have good real-time and historic data, 
we can make good decisions about what and when to do, about what work we want to do next, not just fighting the incidents. And when we understand the impact, we have happy customers, she's way less stressed, and we have happy colleagues. And yeah, happy customers. Customer obsession is one of our leadership principles here at AWS. Leaders start with customers and work backwards from the requirements. And actually, when you build your observability strategy, you need to think about what your customers want and need. So for the rest of this session, we're going to put things into a little um, kind of context. So just bear with us. So imagine Helen and I run a pet adoption website or a pet adoption company. And uh, we have customers that browse that website and adopt animals. So Helen, let's adopt a dog. Awesome. As a customer, I'm a dog fan, but I can adopt cats, bunnies. But as I say, I want a dog, so I'm going to go up to the top and I'm going to search for a puppy. I could choose a color, but I really don't care. I'm going to search and see what's available. Oh, OK, I really wanted that cute guy on the right there, but uh, not available. OK. Oh, I'm going to take this little guy home. So I need to go in, enter in my credit card details, give the charity that donation to pay for the inoculations and things like that. I'm going to pay for that. And voila, I have adopted a dog. Anya, we will be around to visit you soon. Yay, congratulations on your new pet. So Helen, tell me, when you were adopting this dog, did you care at all that one of the EC2 instances was Hot on CPU. Sorry, CPU? I'm trying to pick the dog I want to take home. So you didn't care that the disk space was like at 35% left free on one of the instances? How does that affect me adopting a dog? Exactly. So as techies, we've always kind of concentrated on CPU and RAM, but actually, historically, that's all we used to have. But these are not the metrics to start with. They are metrics that are important, but that's not what we start with. Again, think about what your customers want and need. Think about what service you're providing to your customers and to your business. So with that in mind, let's have a look at what the customers to the pet adoption website want and need. Things like location. They don't want to drive 3,000 miles to pick up a dog, right? Things like choice. If they live in a big city and there's only wolves available, then that's probably not the charity to adopt an animal from. They care about the donation price. If it's unreasonable, they'll find a charity that has a, a more affordable donation price. On the technical side, they care about things like security. If they enter the credit card details, the address details, they want them to be kept secure. They care about how quickly that page loads. How many times have you navigated away from a page because it's frustratingly slow and you just you know, don't want to browse it? And of course, they want to be able to find what they're looking for. Again, they want a, a kind of a stress-free experience and they just want to get adopt the dog that they want. So that's what customers care about. Now, as the CEO, as the pet adoption company, Anya, what about what the business cares about? So our vision is quite simple. We want to find every animal at home. So what matters to us is that our campaigns are successful, that we have people coming to our sites, and that animals are getting adopted. And also we care about money coming in. We need to be able to look after the animals that we have in care. So from the business standpoint, that's what we care about. So with that in mind, let's have a look at what we would observe and what a dashboard would look like. So. I'm just in the CloudWatch console here, and I have this uh, aptly named What Matters dashboard here. And these are some of the things here that we're observing. And just bear with me, I am a Mac user using a Windows machine. So <laughs> good luck with that. OK, so we care about things like how many dogs, cats, and rabbits we adopt. And we have some indicators. We know what good looks like in the last hour and the last day. So what we've actually done, no matter what I choose the time picker at the top there, 
My indicator show me last hour and last day. I've persisted that time range in CloudWatch. So I know if something's not right. I also have these thresholds set. Uh, and these thresholds, again, are indicators to is my application, is my system delivering business value? There's something not quite right in the last hour. So that might be like a slow hour because the last day looks okay. But that might also be an indication that something's not right. So some of the other things that we care about is the total pets that we adopted, donations that are coming in. So we are keeping an eye on this here. So that's business metrics that we're observing. If I move further down, some of that stuff that customers care about. So I'm checking how quickly the page takes to load because customers get frustrated and move away from the site. I'm looking at largest content for paint. So what that is, that is the measure of time that the largest frame takes to load on the page. So of course that's really important because if a customer wants to see an image of a dog, again, they don't want that to, to load for too long. So by the way, that data is coming from a CloudWatch feature called Real User Monitoring. And it allows me to capture real session data to look at metrics such as this one. I'm also looking at the availability of the site of the last hour. Again, it's really important for me to have lots of different customers coming to my site, so I'm tra tracking um, how many sessions are coming through. Again, this is coming from my ROM logs, um, and I'm just putting this, this through, um, through some queries just to have a look how many sessions are coming in. Further down. I've got some widgets for my canaries. So synthetic canaries allow me to run scripts that follow the same path as the user would have. So that middle canary, the pet search canary, is exactly what you saw Helen do. It just navigates to my site. It tries to search for a dog. And you can see there's something not quite right. It's, it's only succeeding 78% of the time. But I am also have a canary directly against the API and that's doing a bit better, so it may be that there's a problem in the front end. But again, I have these canaries because I'm hoping to catch the problems before my actual customers do. And then further down here, I have a couple more bits of information. So this, um, this user information on the left-hand side, uh, I'm using a couple of CloudWatch features there. So I'm using Internet Monitor to see where my traffic is coming from. And then I'm putting it through um, contrib contributor insights just to see the top 50 um, cities from which my traffic is coming. So why is this even important? Who cares? Helen talked about making data-driven decisions. So my second uh, or my third most, um, most visited city is Frankfurt, for example. So if I don't have an adoption center in Frankfurt, that's me using telemetry data to help drive a business decision. I can go to my PMs, I can go to the business and say, we've got lots of traffic coming from Frankfurt. There's people in Frankfurt who want to get animals adopted, and we've got nothing in Frankfurt. Let's open a rescue center. So that's actually driving value from our telemetry data, using telemetry data to make those decisions. Just one last widget on this little dashboard is um, the cost widget. Of course, being a nonprofit, we want to make sure we run everything as cost optimal as possible. So we've tagged everything, and I'm using a custom widget, which basically allows me to use Lambda to pull that data in to my dashboard to keep an eye on the cost. So that's just an, a simple example of what we would be observing in terms of what actually matters to our customers and to the business. But with that in mind, let's go back to actually how you build your observability strategy around that. So we're going to go into step one. And step one of building your observability strategy is to observe what matters. And as you go through these steps, it's really important that you write these things down. Because at each stage, writing these things down will help you, help you later. And step six, you do your tool selection. As you write these things down, choosing the tool will be much, much easier once you have all this information that you've gathered along the way. So write down what matters to your customers, what matters to your business, 
Now, this is the bit that, you know, techies don't really like that much, but you need to speak to those non-techie people. They're, they're not, you know, PMs or business stakeholders typically know these things probably better than techies. So during this stage, it is really important that you work with your internal stakeholders. And then, of course, you know, we might not be here to build an observability strategy for the whole org straight away. Your org might be huge. That's okay. You might be working for a business unit or a project. But actually, the same applies. Every team, every project, every business unit delivers a service. They have customers, internal or external. And without knowing what they want and need, it's going to be much harder for you to observe what actually matters. So that's step one, and that's still the why. Why are you doing this? Why is the system that I'm looking at running? So now that you know why, you can think about what you should be observing. So that's step two. And step two is about looking beyond whether your application is up or down. It's about knowing who else it impacts. So start with defining your success metrics. So every organization typically has some level of success criteria. There could be key performance indicators, there could be service level agreements, service level objectives. It doesn't really matter what they're called. They're just success criteria. You know if you're doing a good service, you know if your system is doing a good service. And of course, those success metrics differ. They'll be different for a pet adoption website, how many donations are coming in, and they'll be different for a multinational hotel chain. But actually, the advice remains the same. You need to know what good looks like so that you can measure against it. How else do you know if your system is delivering well? OK, on to step three. OK, so you've worked out your KPIs. You've worked out what your objectives are. And now you need to think about where your data sources are coming from. Now, you may well find that you already have the data available. You've probably got metrics, logs, perhaps some traces. Maybe the data you need to measure those KPIs is available there. However, it might not be in the right format. You might need to extract data from the formats you already have. As an example, CloudWatch alarms work off metrics, but your data might be sitting in a log file. More on that in a minute. We'll show you a couple of ways to get that data from logs into metrics, but you may have to transform your data. You also may need to look elsewhere for your data. Anya mentioned synthetics to do scripted checks and real user monitoring to gather data from your actual end users. Are those the missing puzzle pieces in your data? So understand where you're going to get the information from to measure those objectives. And finally, plan ahead. Are there common formats you can use? Are there common libraries you can get your developers to use? standard ways that you can get at that data, create your log formats in, anything that helps you get at the right data you need, including thinking about your naming conventions. Good naming conventions help us find the right data at 3 o'clock in the morning. OK, so Helen mentioned about getting data out of log files. So very often, business data can be found in log files. And we're going to show you two ways of doing so. So I'm just going to quickly show you metric filters, which is a way to derive metrics from log data when you don't have control over the, the log format. So in the case of the pet adoption website, I have this log file called ECS pay for adoption. And an absolute confirmation that an adoption has place, uh, taken place is this, um, this post event here. I'm just going to zoom in a bit. So it's just this event here. And basically, this is the kind of the format that com comes in with. The part of the URL has complete adoption in it. It was pet ID 15. It was a dog that got adopted. And it returned a 200. So now that I know what I'm looking for, if this means that a dog has been adopted, somebody's completed the adoption, paid for the adoption, I can catch that entry. And every time that's caught, I can then have a metric. 
So if I just head over um, to my log files again and metric filters, I'll just really briefly show you. So I've got three simple metric filters here. So let's just see the scattered options one. I'm catching this pat pattern. I'm looking for post, complete adoption in the URL, and the word kitten, and the code of 200. Every time that's caught in the log file, detected in the log file, it'll create a metric called cats adopted in the pet site metric namespace with the metric value of one. So of course, once I have this, as you saw before, I can then, I can then count how many cats, dogs, etc. I have adopted. So again, this is a way to, um, to detect business data or to extract business data from log files when you don't have control over the log format. But Helen, do you want to show us how to do this when you do have control? Yeah. So I want to show you one way of doing this called embedded metric format. Now, embedded metric format is a JSON log format. And what it allows us to do is to define the metrics that we want to create, the values we want them to have, and log messages all in one format. And when CloudWatch ingests that data, it'll create those metrics for you automatically. So let me show you what that looks like. We have a lambda here that we're using to create this embedded metric format, or EMF, log file. So what I have at the top, I'm defining what my metric looks like. So that is one metric called adoptions. And I have three different types of dimensions here. I am saying I want to count my adoptions in terms of pet type, but I also want to count them in terms of color, and I also want to count them in terms of pet type and color. So I'm really defining three separate types of metrics there for adoptions. I have a second metric here for the promotion. Promotion type. Did this come from the email blast that you set up? Did it come from a referral advert on another web page? Here, my metric is called promotion. And this time, my dimension is promo type, just one. I only need to aggregate against one dimension. And all of these metrics are going into the namespace of EMF pet site. So those are my definitions of my metrics. And underneath, I'm telling it the values. So I'm sending count into this function, so how many adoptions, the pet color and the pet type. And then I'm doing the same for my promotion with the promotion type and the count. Now what I can also do is add a log event. So here I've got some additional information. I've got an order ID. Maybe a specific person had an issue and I want to look at the metrics around that order ID. So I can connect them together through that log event because it's in the same event as the metrics. I also have in here the redirection source. It's really useful to know where your traffic is coming from. How did it get to you? So that's my Lambda script to create the EMF. Let's have a quick look at what that looks like in CloudWatch logs. So here we have the log event that came in. Right at the top, here is my extra log message I created. And I could have put a lot more information in here. There's my order ID for my kitten. Um, it was a pet food promotion that came in through. And here's the email campaign. So that log event, it's a log. I can use log insights. I can use log insights on this whole log. And then we see the definitions of the metrics that we just looked at a minute ago. And right at the bottom, we see the values. So this adoption was one brown kitten from the pet site promo. And I even have my x-ray trace here if I want to connect that data together. So now I can connect metrics, logs, and traces all together. And as that event comes into CloudWatch logs, CloudWatch goes and generates those metrics Let's have a quick look. So here I'm in my EMF pet site namespace. Here's all those dimensions I mentioned, by pet type, by color, 
by pet type and color, and by promotion type. And if I go and explore this data, you'll see there's my bunnies, kittens, and puppies, and I can graph, alarm, whatever I normally do with metrics. So EMF is really good when you have control over your logs and you want a single mechanism to get that data in. So now that we've had a look at a couple of ways of pulling that data out of log files, let's jump back to our strategy. So we have had a look at what our KPIs are. We know what matters. We've worked out where our data is coming from. We've written all this down so that we don't forget. And now we need to think about how we're going to use this data. So the first thing we start with is our alerting strategy. The first thing I want you to do as you decide what you want to alert on is think about how important this is. What is the criteria for this? Not just what's the value, but is this a critical alarm or just a warning? Do we need to jump to this now or is it something we can pick up later? Not everything is critical. There are issues if everything is critical. And then I need you to define your actions. If you don't know what you're doing with the alarm, don't create the alarm. Okay? Even if your action is, this is the team that needs to know about it. But ideally, you have a bit more than that. And the more you know, the more you can start creating playbooks so that 3 o'clock in the morning, Anya doesn't have to start from scratch. She can learn from what happened last time. And even better, can you automate some of that? Once you've defined your actions and your criteria, I want you to have another look at your alarms and think about, have you got too many? Now, if we do too few alarms, sure, we know nothing. We lose visibility. But we do too many alarms, and it's like those really irritating car alarms that everyone ignores. Your alarms need to be specific, they need to be actionable, and they need to be important. They should not be everyday noise. And a great way to drive your alert strategy and your whole observability strategy is by reviewing after incidents. Incidents usually cost you money and they cost you time. Did you get the right data to the right people? Rethink what have you got in your run books? Let's make this as easy as possible the next time that happens because, you know, it probably will. Anya, tell us about dashboards. Okay, so now that you know what you're gonna need from your alarms, it's time to think about your dashboards. And dashboards are that human facing view into how your systems are performing. So you need, to, you need to plan ahead with them again. So you're gonna need some high level and some low level dashboards. Um, so start with defining what stakeholder dashboards you're gonna need. Like I mentioned, you know, us techies don't necessarily always like talking to business stakeholders, but also business stakeholders come to us for some data very often, and typically you either don't have that data, or it's a massive pain to try and get that data, but they genuinely need the data. So design those stakeholder dashboards, so if your service is a dependency to somebody else, or if PMs or the, the audit team rely on information, Design them from the start and know what dashboards you're going to make available to your business stakeholders and to other business units. And then think about your high-level dashboards. Again, the aim of a good observability strategy is to surface issues before they affect your customers. And those high-level dashboards, those customer experience dashboards, those service instance dashboards, they're going to actually signal that something might not be right for the customers and for the business. So CPU and disk space might be absolutely fine, but these will signal if there's something that will impact. Now you are gonna need some low level dashboards. I know I've been knocking CPU and, and disk space and, and RAM, but you do need it. It can actually um, impact your business. So with the high level dashboards, you're doing this outside in observability. With the low-level dashboards, you're going to do that inside-out observability. And on these dependency dashboards and infrastructure dashboards is where you're going to find those CPU and RAM metrics as well. Now that you know what dashboards you're going to need, 
you're going to have to also think about those additional requirements. Again, these are going to drive your tool selection later down the line. So have a think. Have you outsourced first line to a third party and you don't want to give everybody an AWS account? How are you going to share these dashboards with people? You might need a tool that integrates with your IDP through SSO, so you can share the dashboards with that third party. You might need cross-account data. You need, might need some custom data. But by writing these requirements down, tool selection will be much easier. And we're at step six, tool selection. But now that you've got all this information about KPIs, what matters, what signals you're going to use to measure against success criteria, what alerts you're going to need, what dashboards you're going to need, it will make it much easier for you to then go ahead and pick the right tool for the job. Now, do your research, have a think about what you're going to need in the next three to five years, and please pick the features that you actually need. This is, again, very common, something that Trishal, Helen, and I see with customers. They have cool features in the observability tools that they don't use 70% of. So think about the features you're actually going to need and drive your tool selection around what you need and what you've collected so far. Take this opportunity to consolidate and standardize as well. Having multiple tools can make things a lot more complex. If you, if you have an SRE at 3 in the morning that has to log into multiple tools, has to remember how to log into multiple tools, has to look on multiple screens to correlate, that makes things harder for them. Or if you're a developer moving from team to team and you have to learn a new tool every time, again, that makes it harder. It can also be more expensive. But another way that our customers are standardizing, and this is something we talk to our customers a lot, is on the format of the telemetry data. And a lot of our customers are choosing open telemetry. Because instrumenting the application to give out open telemetry data is probably the, the, the most effort, the hardest part. So if you can implement open telemetry and then you don't get your tool choice quite right, then it's relatively easy to change the config file to send that data somewhere else. So think about standardizing on the format as well. And also, there's always going to be some team that the tool that you've selected doesn't work for. That's fine, but document some form of an exception process. Because you don't want people going ahead and just using different tools because you know, you're not willing to listen. Have this exception process have some kind of a trade-off document where you tell people, we're going to standardize on the format or the alert layer or the dashboarding layer. So that's tool selection. So we're just going to show you an example of some of our tools that will help you correlate. And uh, Helen's going to kindly do that for us. So we've looked a bit at metrics and logs. But the other key part of most people's observability strategy is traces. So I just want to have a look at that. We'll show you it within CloudWatch um, and see how that might fit in and help your strategy. So in CloudWatch, traces are governed by the services X-ray and service lens. And this is our pet adoption site service map, or a portion of it. Now, this map is generated for you automatically from the trace data that you gather. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing circular nodes, some of the service icons you'll recognize. I see some lambdas there in the middle. I see an S3 bucket in the bottom. And on the left, the little heads, those are our synthetic canaries that we talked about earlier. Now, I can see information both about the node, so the lambda function, and the connections between them. But what I want to look at is why we have this little bit of red around our pet site, our search canary that we looked at earlier. And that red indicates that there are some failures happening. So how do I use traces to understand what's going on? So if I pick that node, I will start to see some generic um, aggregate metrics about that. Latency, requests, success, you're all used to those kind of metrics. But I can also go and view the traces involved that come from that canary. So let's go and have a look. 
Now, I get a whole lot of data here. I'm going to come back to the top in a minute. But here are all my traces. Now, these are all showing OK. I'm not interested in them. They're good. So I'm going to go and filter my traces and look for those that have a status code of 500. So I'm going to add this to my trace query. It's going to do the hard work for me. And then I'm going to run that query. Now, what I see is the information only for my failures. OK, so now I can see response code, response time. I want to know more than this. I want to look at the details of what's actually happening. So let me jump into one of those examples. Now, the first thing I see is the trace map just for that single trace, where now we've gone from an aggregate to a single trace. I'm getting some color help here. The pet site search canary is failing. The pet site API is failing. The Fargate container behind that is failing. So what does that mean? If I scroll further down, I can see a timeline of my trace. I can see the status, where it's failing, the response code, the duration, and this time graph, colored and with duration equal to the length. And I can start to see now that where it's actually failing is within that Fargate container. And if I click on this, I can start to see more information about that specific stage in the trace. I'm looking at the exceptions tab here. And I can actually see that my exception is an access denied for S3. I can also see the stack trace. Now I have the information to go and fix this error. And using traces connected with the metrics we saw about latency, connected with the aggregate status, all of these things are going to help you with your observability strategy. Whatever tool you choose, traces are probably going to be part of your journey. OK, so let's go back to the strategy. And I'm passing over to Anya. <laughs> okay. OK, so the last two stages are actually not technical. They're process stages, but they are also really, really important. So in step seven, you bring it all together. Make sure you work with everybody that this affects. But also, I know it sounds obvious, but document your strategy. If you want your developers to write the log format in embedded metric format, make sure they have this information to hand. Make this available. Make this a living document. Build your observability strategy into your internal processes. Like Helen said before, build into your incident management. Review that the dashboards, the alarms, are giving you what they need. Now, when it comes to implementing your observability strategy, don't try to do this all at once. So I've come across this saying at, at Amazon, but apparently it's quite an old saying, um, is don't try to boil the ocean. Uh, what does that mean? Is it easier to boil the water in the kettle or to build the water in, uh, sorry, to boil the water in the kettle or to boil the water in the ocean? And of course, it's the kettle. So think about, pick one of the services, maybe the most important service, and apply your strategy to that. Or pick just the alerting layer or the format or the dashboarding layer. But remember, again, it's, it's a process, it's a migration. So don't think that you have to do this all at once. And on to step eight, Helen. Thanks. So another process stage. And here we're talking about back to this being a journey. It's really important not to define, implement, and stop. We need to iterate. We all know this. We need to do it. So no matter how big or small you start, no matter whether you start with one application or an entire area. We need to understand, first of all, our baselines. We said that right at the beginning. But things change. You implement new functionality. Your expectations about your user experience change. And you need to make sure you update those baselines. Because without them, without knowing what good looks like, we don't know when things are wrong. And you need to review this routinely. Now, I mentioned in the alerting strategy that incidents are a great driver of that review. They're a great driver of your whole observability review. 
making sure that you learn the lessons, look at the slightly bigger picture from the last incident. Where can we catch those general cases rather than that specific issue? Make sure that you review who gets the data and whether it was timely enough and the actions that you took. Update those run books, update those automations. And finally, let's go right back to the beginning. So we started with our customer experience. This is the cycle we need to keep going around. What are our customers' needs? What are our business stakeholders' needs and where do they fit in? That's going to lead us to the KPIs, the objectives, and the data we need to collect. Then we need to keep thinking around how we act on that data, how we improve it, and all of that should lead us back around to improving that user customer experience again. Anya, do you want to summarize? Yes, let's summarize what we've covered today then. OK, so remember, first start with thinking where you are and where you want to be. So it's time to get your phones out if you want to. There's a QR code on the screen. That will take you to the observability maturity model. So you can use that to establish where you are and where you want to be. Once you have that, remember to observe your matters. What matters? <laughs> define what matters to your customers. Define what matters to your business. Work with those business stakeholders. Again, if, if, you're, um, if it's a strategy for, for a project, also define what matters to the people that, that depend on you. Then remember to measure your objectives. Define the success criteria. Write down those KPI, SLO, SLAs, or whatever else it is. And remember that you need to know what good looks like. So then you can measure against that. Once you know your KPIs, identify the signals that your application has given out that will help you measure against those objectives. It's really important that you either know where this data is coming from, or you might have to extract it, like Helen explained. From there, think about your alerting strategy. Remember to alert only when business outcomes are at risk, and remember to avoid alert fatigue. Then think about your dashboards. Think about what stakeholder dashboards you're going to need, those high-level and those low-level dashboards. Now, that QR code on the screen takes you to um, a builder's library document named Building Dashboards for Operational Visibility. That one explains in a lot more detail on how to design your dashboards. It's, it's one of my favorite documents at AWS, so, so check it out. It's a great document. OK. Once you know all these things, you've written them down, it should be easier for you to select the right tool for the job. Remember to pick the features you actually need and think about consolidating and standardizing. Now, you've seen the Pet Adoption website today. Actually, it's part of the one observability workshop that we run with our customers that you can run yourself. So if AWS tools are the tools that you want to select as part of your strategy, check out the one observability workshop. It shows you how to use those tools. Uh, we update it very frequently, so keep checking back in. Again, you can run it with your AWS team. You can run it in your own account. Um, so that's the middle QR code there for you. And then remember the process. Remember to document your strategy. And remember, don't try to boil the ocean. Just boil the kettle first. And then lastly, remember to iterate. Like Tushal said, observability it's a journey, not a destination. So just remember, the, the key point is to keep focus on your customers. The last QR code takes you to the AWS Observability Best Practices Guide. A lot of the information in this presentation is based on that, on that guide. So there's a QR code there for you to check out. Helen? OK, so we're just about there. Um, I'm sure some of you will want to have conversations this week. If you're looking to talk with observability specialists like ourselves, then a lot of our colleagues will be in the Venetian, in the expo, at the observability booth. 
Please go and talk to them. We all love talking to customers. That's why we do this job. We will also be available outside this room once we're finished for questions. We'd love to talk to you. Um, I believe there's some swag there too. I hear it's a thing. We've also deliberately left a few minutes today because we're really data-driven as an organization. It's not just observability data. Please take a couple of the minutes you have free now to fill out the survey, give us some feedback so that we can improve things like this for you in the future. Thank you so much for your time today and we all hope you have a great reInvent.